happen, but something might happen, and therefore preemptively we need to, we need to pursue this matter. That's, that's a thin read legally, a really thin read. And unlike the Chairman, I have no confidence it would actually be upheld in the Court, given the fact there is no there there, according to the Office of Special Counsel. In sharp contrast to the previous administration, which was described, their, their Office of Political Affairs was described as the political boiler room. This one, according to Carolyn Lerner, who was here to testify before this committee but was not allowed to, uh, she found no violations of the Hatch Act. Uh, and, by the way, what is ironic is, uh, in the advertisement of the title of the hearing, uh, the majority staff got the title wrong. They cited the White House Office of Political Affairs. That is the title of the Bush Administration Office. It is not the title of the current Administration's Office. Maybe that was a Freudian slip, although if they want to go back to the Bush Administration, to examine in great oversight detail, knowing their commitment to oversight, about the many, many violations that occurred in that administration, unlike this administration, which has been found to be cleaned by Carol Lerner from the Office of Special Counsel, they will have full Democratic support. Um, this is a sad day because I think I would say to my friends on the other side of the aisle, especially those with legal training, I think we are going to do damage to our institution. We are, we are going to degrade our credibility in legitimate oversight and in a legitimate assertion of the rights of the legislative branch vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch, because we are abusing that and we have no foundation for this action. We are going to take it because you get the votes. But should we take it is a different matter. I uh, now yield to my friend uh, from California, Mrs. Spears. Uh, I thank my good friend and colleague, and I'm going to make sure I have some time left over for my good friend, Mr. Lynch. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. This is a patently political action. And I agree with my colleague when he says that we are p placing this institution in great harm and doing great damage to it. As my colleague, Ms. Norton, said, this is a fishing expedition. We are talking about an office with $1 million of taxpayer funds. That is it, $1 million. If we are co so concerned that they are making sure that they are using this money for uh, precisely the right purposes, then call in the General Accounting Office, which is available to us night and day, and have them go and audit the office. Two and a half months ago, I sent to the Chairman of this committee a letter asking him to start an investigation, hold a hearing on Health Management Associates, which has already ripped off the taxpayers of this country by $600 million in Medicare and Medicaid fraud. Are we doing anything to look at something as important as that issue? Oh, no. We want to investigate the President's $1 million political office to see whether or not the funds are being used for a political or a governmental purpose. This is a mockery, and I stand with my colleagues objecting to it. I now yield, I yield back. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I now yield the balance of my time to my friend from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. I thank the gentleman and the gentlelady for, for yielding. You know, uh, a number of times I've heard the assertion that we don't know what we don't know, but we do know what we do know. And Republican staff went to the White House and asked a whole lot of the questions that you just asked. They asked. Uh, what, what are the functions of this office? You say you don't know? Well, your staff went over there and they, they got the answers. And the White House explained that uh, the, the new office is set up for two primary functions. One is to obtain information for political candidates and groups to help inform the President's policy agenda and make sure that his positions are being portrayed accurately and effectively. And then also to serve as a single point of contact to receive invitations to the President and First Lady to participate in political events and uh, send p political communications on behalf of the candidates and political parties to determine whether these event invitations should be accepted. And apparently before this happened, under the Bush administration, all different offices of, of the White House would get invitations, which, which led to potential violations of the Hatch Act. So they are concentrated in one, this one office. So if you take the time, your staff did a very good job. They did a very good job. They asked some very pointed questions. 
uh, of the White House when they went over there, and, and the White House, in fairness to them, did answer those questions. So, uh, and, and all without a subpoena, and all without a, a public show, and all without interfering with the, uh, the, the right of, uh, of the President's counsel uh, to, to advise him. So uh, I think the White House has been very cooperative in this respect. And, uh, you know, the fact that you can't find anything wrong is no reason to offer a subpoena. I yield back. Pursuant to the uh, unanimous consent, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, will control the last six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want, to, I want to thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. I have learned a lot this morning. Mr. Chairman, I have learned uh, that you can have a firmly rooted constitutional right to assert on behalf of an entity that is neither named nor contemplated by the Constitution. I previously was not aware of that. What I would like us to leave with today is some consensus on what the standard is. I, I just want to understand, because I, I, I honestly think there is a hunger in this country for any group to apply the same standard, the same rules, regardless of politics, regardless of which party is in power. Recess appointments should not depend upon which jersey the President has on. I think we can all agree on that. So too, the power to summon somebody before the People's House should not depend upon which party is in power. And what I have heard from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle this morning cannot possibly be the standard. The standard cannot simply be that you have to have done something wrong. We don't have the power to investigate criminal conduct. You all know that. You remind us of that all the time. We don't have the power to investigate or prosecute criminal wrongdoing. That is another branch. So that cannot possibly be the standard. Can we summon someone before Congress to discuss good news? What if they have done a good job? Can we send them a summons? Can we invite them to come share with us the progress and the success they have had? Not under your standard. Can we invite someone to come discuss how to take their department from good to great? You are doing a good job. Let's do a great job. Can we summon them before the people's house? Not according to your standard. Can we invite them to discuss appropriations? Can we summon them to, a, to discuss policy? Not according to your standard. Your standard is you have to have done something wrong or you have to have broken a law. And you all know that can't be right. you got really bright lawyers over there. You know that we have no power to investigate criminal wrongdoing. So how can that possibly be the standard? What is the standard going forward after today? When can this branch, when can the People's House summon people to come? Can we discuss policy? Appropriations? Good news? Can we bring them over to say you're doing a great job? Or is it only when it verges on criminal wrongdoing will you concede that we have the power? This is what is most vexing for me. And this is what I really want. I really want some of the very reasonable-minded folks on the other side of the aisle to think about. Are you really willing to concede that this branch has less power to summon than the other two branches? Because that's what I hear you saying. The judicial branch doesn't only have the power to summon people upon an allegation of wrongdoing. The executive branch doesn't only have the power to summon people. Some of you have done criminal work. You can send a grand jury subpoena to someone who is totally innocent. They just happen to have facts that you are interested in. A circuit court judge, a district court judge can send in a civil case a subpoena to someone. There is no allegation of criminal wrongdoing. You all know that. Many of you have practiced that. So why are you telling us that we have less power than the other two branches under the Constitution? What is the standard going forward after today? Can somebody explain to me, because we all believe in bright lines, and I may live long enough one day, I don't know if I will or not, but I may live long enough to see a Republican president. So what is the standard going to be? Gentlemen, yield. What is yield. the standard going to be? 
Well, the because I'll tell you what I would like to do. I, I, I will in just a second, although I hasten to add your colleagues did not give you any time, and they should have because you're one of the brightest members on that side. But I may, if I have some time left, do what they were not willing to do. But I do want someone to tell me, if there's a Republican president, are you willing to apply the same standard? Are we willing to apply the same? I mean, look, look into your well of souls and say at the end of this debate, is this a standard we can live with regardless of who is in power? Can we really only bring witnesses? I'm not talking about testimony. That is executive privilege. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. It is the power to summon someone before the people's house. It's the new standard only if you have done something wrong and only if we have a hint of criminal impropriety. If that's the new standard, then let's live with it going forward. I just think you're, going, you're giving short shrift to the people's house. The reality that we can't bring someone here to talk about good things they're doing or policy improvements, that we can't bring the Secretary of Agriculture before a committee of Congress to discuss something that's not wrong and not criminal. Really, you need to, you need to think about what we're doing today. And whether or not you are in the short term shortening your own constitutional prerogative, because honestly, after all the morning's worth of debate, I cannot tell you what the standard is going forward. I can't do it. With that, I would yield gentleman back to the chairman. I'd ask unanimous consent. The gentleman have an additional 30 seconds without objection, so ordered. Be delighted to yield to my friend from Massachusetts. Thank you very much. And we'd be delighted to say that we wish you a long and healthy life uh, during which no Republican president serves. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, thank you for yielding. Uh, first of all, you know, this is all in the context of a Hatch investigation, Hatch Act investigation, so I think we went a little bit off the line on that basis. Under your theory that we'd be able to subpoena tomorrow the Chief of Staff of the uh, President and bring him in here for any reason, whatever, and I don't think that's where we want to go on this. The standard is, and I mentioned it in my early remarks, set forth by the court in the Myers case. Uh, and it talks about having a legitimate use of investigative authority in order to bring in an advisor to the President uh, and talk on that basis, and first exhausting, or at least coming to an impasse with each other, of not getting the information you are seeking uh, for just mere oversight in some other way. So if the standard for a legitimate investigation is that you have to have reached some impasse and then have an investigation where you can't get the answers any other way, is there, then certainly for something of just mere oversight would require a lot more on that basis. And there has been no showing to date in this case of the White House not cooperating. I, I thank the gentleman. All time having expired, I move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform approve the resolution rejecting, cl rejecting claim that David Seamus is immune from being compelled to testify before this Congress on matters relating to his official duties. The question is, on approving the resolution, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any op opposed say no. 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 Clearly, in the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Issa. Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Micah. Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan votes aye. Mr. McHenry. Mr. Jordan. Mr. Chaffetz. Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Wahlberg votes aye. Mr. Langford. Mr. Langford votes aye. Mr. Amash. Yes. Mr. Amash votes aye. Mr. Gosar. Aye. Mr. Gosar votes aye. Mr. Meehan. Aye. Mr. Meehan votes aye. Dr. Desjardins. Mr. Gowdy. Yes. Mr. Gowdy votes aye. Mr. Farenthold. Aye. Mr. Farenthold votes aye. Mr. Hastings. Mr. Hastings votes aye. Mrs. Lummis. Mrs. Lummis votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Mr. Woodall votes aye. Mr. Massey. Aye. Mr. Collins. Aye. Mr. Collins votes aye. Mr. Meadows. Mr. Meadows votes aye. Mr. Bentivoglio. Aye. Mr. Bentivoglio votes aye. Mr. DeSantis. Aye. Mr. DeSantis votes aye. Mr. Cummings. No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mrs. Maloney. No. Mrs. Maloney votes no. Ms. Norton. No. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Tierney. No. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay. Mr. Lynch. No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Connolly. Nay. Mr. Connolly votes no. Ms. Spear. Ms. Beer votes no. Mr. Cartwright. I would like to associate myself with the words of the ranking member, and I vote no. Mr. Cartwright votes no. Ms. Duckworth? No. Ms. Duckworth votes no. Ms. Kelly? Absolutely not. Ms. Kelly votes no. Mr. Davis? Mr. Welch? No. 
Mr. Welch votes no. Mr. Cardenas? No. Mr. Cardenas votes no. Mr. Horsford? No. Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Lewin Grisham? No. Ms. Lewin Grisham votes no. All members voted. The clerk will call the roll. Uh, On that vote, sir, 14, uh, uh, 19 ayes, 14 noes. In the resolution rejecting the claim that David Seamus is immune to being compelled to testify before Congress on matters related to his official duties is approved, and we stand adjourned.